this live. Thank you. Good morning and thanks to everyone for joining us today. Uh, I'm Susie Proctor, chairing the subcommittee for education. And our topic today is transportation. Um, our schools are planning to reopen and we, we can imagine how complex and how difficult that is. But how often do we think about those 130 some thousand children getting to school and back home safely? And, and what a challenge that must be. Uh, and, and then add to that all of the protections that have to be provided because of COVID. So this morning, we are, we are very lucky, very pleased to have with us the Director of Transportation, Dr. Saunders. And if he would talk to us about how he gets all these children to school and home again safely, and, and then with the compound of, of COVID. Dr. Well, Saunders. Okay, well, good morning. Um, I do have a, a brief PowerPoint. Should I share that on the screen or you want me to just talk about it? Why don't you share it? Okay. Okay. Um, hope that everybody can see that. So um, in starting first with what we normally do. So all of our buses um, leave out every morning and they each cover anywhere from three to five schools a day in the morning. And then they do somewhat the reverse in the afternoon to pick students up. And that might be a combination based on bell times of elementary, middle, high, special needs students. Um, some of our non-public schools, although they usually don't have as many routes. So when we schedule our routes and the earliest schools begin about 745, latest schools usually around 915, we try to have time between each route, obviously, to drop kids off, pick kids up in the neighborhood safely, get them to the next school, et cetera. So there are some changes that we're going to have to make that are related to how we're moving students during this, this time as we return. So what you see here is a configuration of the school bus that we would adjust. So one of the things that has come up is about social distancing during this time. So these are some of the steps we're taking to help keep both our students and our staff safe on the buses. Um, so the configuration there you see demonstrates where we would allow students to, see, to sit. So as you can see here, we're going to have only one student per seat. And that gives us about 21 students. I must add, if other adults are on the bus, that would be included in that 21 number. We keep the seat open directly behind the driver to give them space um, in terms of their distance. Students are obviously wearing masks throughout the entire trip, as are our staff. Now, the driver would have on a mask, but not the face shield. But during the time kids are getting on and off the bus, they would wear a shield to give them some additional support during that time to keep them and the students safe. Sometimes we have support staff on buses, particularly with our special needs students. So that might be bus attendants, one-to-one -one aides, or in some cases nurses. So they may also factor into this, um, this number of 21. The normal routes, just to give you an idea, would have been scheduled. We sometimes have anywhere from 45 to almost 50 students on a bus normally. So this is going to be a reduction, but keep in mind, we're basing that on the hybrid schedule where students are only coming on either Monday and Tuesday with half the alphabet or Thursday and Friday for the other half. So we're hoping that this kind of matches that number where the reduced capacity would match that so this wouldn't become an, an overload. We also are going to have to come up with a way to have circulation of air on the bus. So one of our ideas to increase the airflow is to use the recommendation of cracking the windows and in some cases the hatch on top of the bus so that we just get some um, refresh of air during the trip. Um, if it's a little colder, we're gonna to try to compensate by increasing the heat. And obviously by the time we get through May and maybe June and we know it's a little warmer, we'll try to increase the air condition where possible. So this just kind of reiterates some of what I just talked about. Um, we're asking that students, as they enter the bus, wait 
you know, at the stop, keeping their distance until they get there. Um, we, we're going to assist them as they get on to try to keep away from each other so we don't have them kind of mob up so the driver will give them those directions. And when they exit, we stop the bus and tell them they don't just jump up, but we try to have some kind of orderly um, exit off the bus so that we don't have everybody getting on and off at the same time. Now, one of the things you'll see here is there are students who may have medical reasons that they cannot wear a mask. In those cases, we're providing staff with additional PPEs so that they can be near those students or work with those students and do some seating accommodations to keep them a little further away from everyone. However, students who just refuse to wear masks will not be able to ride the bus. So we'll be referring that to the school team to contact the parent to say, as they've been told at the beginning, that the requirement is that they wear the mask for the entire trip, pretty much in the same way they're gonna be asked to wear those masks during the school day and maintain their face cover. So our staffs obviously also are gonna maintain all of that. So they're gonna follow those protocols for social distancing and cleaning between each trip. So we'll look at each trip as a separate part of the route and they'll wipe down those high contact areas during you know, the, the transition for each group of kids. We treat all of our buses before and after each day to spray them with ionizer so that um, we can make sure we've done everything we can to sanitize those buses. And then we also are communicating with parents if there's any issues with that, um, with the pick up or drop off. The non-public schools and special centers will probably have the greatest challenge. We do um, transport students into a number of places outside of Prince George's County. We go as far as Frederick, we go to Baltimore, we go into Washington, D.C., and we even have a few schools located in Virginia. So we know those students' rides are a little longer, and we want to make sure that we make different accommodations for those runs. They're usually special needs students, or in some cases homeless. So they have fewer students on the bus, and it allows us to get closer to the distancing that was recommended with the six-foot um, distance. But they still need to wear the mask, if possible, unless they have the medical um, determination as is listed here. One of our challenges before, and I think when you asked originally, is just what we normally do. Our challenge has been vacancies. We, we have a very aggressive program to train bus drivers. We recruit. We hire as many as possible. Our human resources department works very closely with us in doing that. We've even had programs now because obviously one of the most challenging things to do is have a CDL. Um, it, it's a matter of being able to get past the background check, past the necessary medical tests, then they have to maintain that. So we do everything from random drug testing, we monitor driver's licenses, and as you can imagine, we lose people in many cases due to infractions. So we have a high turnover and we're in an area where there are so many school districts and employers nearby that are also looking for people with CDLs. The competition is immense and we struggle to get the numbers we need. So this just gives you a snapshot of where we are if we were opening tomorrow and open runs, meaning that's basically more runs that we currently have drivers on our payroll. And then you have people who are on some type of leave, whether it's on disability leave, injuries. We've had people in and out due to quarantine and COVID leave. And then we have the last thing, which is pool drivers. We have no substitute bus drivers. Every driver that we have hired is on a route. So basically on a normal day, if you have the normal expectancy of anywhere from five to maybe 8% attendance, that's another group of people that we have to cover. Anybody who's not here, that's a bus that isn't going to run. So we have to use existing staff that's on another route to go do that. After they finish their route, sometimes we use our office staff, such as our foreman and assistant foreman, who all have CDLs. And sometimes they have to close down the office and go make that route. Or we pull any kind of driver trainers or anyone else we have to cover routes as best we can. Needless to say, that has great impact on our ability to perform um, on-time arrivals and to make sure we can communicate with everybody as far as what's happening. So this tells you here, we basically, to be at an optimum level right now, need about another 196 employees right now to be able to do that. We, we are realistic 
We know that while we have hired some people, it's slowed down during the time we've been out for this last year. Um, we know that there's some people who, when it's time to come back, may not feel comfortable. We may lose some individuals. We aren't sure. And we're just hopeful that we can at least um, balance out with hiring um, to at least be where we are now. And this is our recruitment efforts. Just to give you an idea, we have had even during the time we've been out, virtual job fairs and interviews. We've done as much of the hiring and training as we can. We have hired people who do not have a CDL and we have our driver trainers perform training virtually so that they can get ready to take both their learner's permit for the CDL, the necessary information they need to be able to perform the functions. And we even have some practice before they do their behind the wheel testing so that we can kind of grow our own in some cases. Um, it is slowed down. We need any help we can get with recruiting more individuals and, and encouraging individuals to want to come and join us. A lot of our workforce is sometimes people who have retired from another employer and they come join us in retirement sometimes as a you know great way to supplement income or just to, to do something and work with kids. So we hope that we'll, as we open, more people will feel more comfortable and that we'll be able to help close that gap. So. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, when you say other people are stealing your CDL uh, drivers, is that mainly because of salary, because of the money? It's hard to say. Um, once you have a CDL, you can, you can drive a bus, but you can also drive a dump truck or 18 wheeler. So sometimes people just say, they'd rather not work with kids, but they still wanna drive. Um, it's hard to say. Uh, we've, we've thought maybe it was salary, and we've done a lot of salary enhancements over the last five years. Our board and CEO have worked hard to make sure we remain competitive. As far as local school districts, we're one of the higher school districts. I will say that Prince George's County is one of the few remaining school districts where we actually uh, manage our own transportation system. We actually have our employees that work for us. So we are in competition with contractors who some school districts have gone that route and that salary could be a little more, but they also aren't given some of the benefits and retirement and things that we give. So it's hard to compare just in straight salary in terms of those packages. But we do lose some of the school districts, but I think it's more so losing the other avenues. We're in competition with Metro, the bus, and we're wondering what Amazon is going to bring. As Amazon comes on board, we know they're going to be looking for people with CDLs. And this is a nationwide shortage. I've seen a lot of conferences, and this is always one of the top three topics at every conference is what are we going to do about, you know, shortage of people with CDLs? Because it's so hard to find people, and it's even harder to maintain them. Okay, we have several hands up. Um, Delegate Lewis, you have a question? Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Dr. Saunders. Thank you for that presentation. It's much appreciated, brother. Um, I have a couple uh, questions. Uh, the first being, I was wondering, are, are we considering barriers uh, surrounding the drivers? And I, and I ask that because I have my families from New York and I have an uncle who passed away from COVID uh, because they didn't give him the barriers around him in, in time. That's how he contracted it. So um, we know that Typically, children, you know, uh, are uh, you know don't uh, contract it as, as much. I'm just wondering, are beyond the face shields for them, <clears throat> will they have physical barriers uh, to protect them? No, there we won't be doing any installation of barriers on the buses. One of the reasons is in order to do that, that is a um, that would be a state requirement that would have to be waived. So none of the other school districts have, have been able to do that yet. I think people have considered asking for that waiver, but I don't think it has occurred in any way that I'm aware of yet. We did we did take a look at the barriers, but those are a number of reasons we haven't uh, instituted them on all the buses. We've got, uh, what, 1,200 and some buses. So. Yeah, that's, yeah has, have any of the drivers brought it up drivers have, have you know drivers see things they read things in the media or hear about things that are going on in other places so they've asked it hasn't become a big issue they haven't really pushed for that 
I'm sure they wouldn't necessarily be opposed to it. But again, um, the the safety issue that goes along with it has been one. And there's a cost factor too. But I don't think that's been the main reason we haven't done that. But thus far, I don't know of anyone who that has been approved at the state level to even be able to do it. So. Okay. Yeah. Just, just like that's something I'm concerned about. I understand the cost factors. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, how does, um, I, this one, I might have missed it, but how will the, I know we have a shortage of CDL drivers, but even the number of students on the bus per day, how does that uh, work when all the students won't likely be there every day? I well, that's a good question. So hopefully, of course, we have no way of knowing yet how many students are coming back. As you know, Dr. Goldson put a survey out and when we finish the results from the parent survey, we'll have a much better feel, one of how many students are gonna to return to in-person instruction. And then within that number, how many are gonna opt for the bus? Because even some of them may say, I'm coming back, but I'll you know, bring my own kids yeah. to school so I don't have to deal with that. So yeah. once we have that number, we'll have a better snapshot of where we are. But we're assuming if we had 45 or 50 before and we're only bringing half our children back at a time, that that'll put us more in line with that 21 number. Okay. Um, you know, we, but, but of course, it's not a perfect split because we're dividing the school by alphabet. The mm -hmm. bus route may not necessarily fall within alphabet. <laughs> right. In the neighborhood. Everybody's that's, that's what I was thinking. Jackson and Jameson. So, you know, we, we have to make sure that's going to work out that way. Let me That's throw this in there real quick, Dr. Saunders. Although we're only bringing 50% back, that is if all 50% came back. So we're looking at the maximum on those uh, hybrid days would be 50%. But if, you know, 30% of the parents are like not to send their children back, then that number even, you know, dwindles. And, you know, we're basically hoping that we can make sure that we can provide that service. So, you know, we're not looking for the number to be 50%, uh, Delegate Lewis, even on the days that, uh, um, you know, two days that we have the uh, alphabet split. You know, you all have a logistical nightmare uh, on your hands uh, as far as, uh, you know, how do you how do you figure out the routes with, you know, a, uh, a through J is coming and then Tuesday and Thursday, I guess it's, you know, L through the rest, but maybe not all of them. And I, I don't envy you uh, on that. I just thought to, to bring it That's up. That's why we got Dr. Saunders. <laughs> I got it handled right. <laughs> That's but, why we have Dr. Sorry, but seriously, but, 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 we uh, have a bid uh, process for that too. Yeah, for the drivers, but what right, we, yeah. but we have done with the survey putting out uh, what what Dr. Olson has asked is that when the parents make a decision, that decision um, will will stick. So in other words, right. if you do not elect to send your students back, uh, then then you you can't after uh, we begin in person instruction. However, if you do elect to send them back and you and you want to retreat as a parent to uh, all online learning, and they can do that. So we hope to solidify that number prior to students coming back, and then we can develop our plan because the survey is out now; it closes on the twenty eighth. So then we'll get a, we'll get a better gist of how we approach the you know entire situation with with the reduction well reduction with the shortage of drivers. It's not a reduction because re reduction implies that it'll be back sometime soon. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, with the shortage of drivers, um, you know, and then we can calculate based on how many are returning to in-person instruction, you know, how we best count. We we all may be driving. We may be reaching out for you to drive just in the morning <laughs> or the afternoon, but, you know, we, we have so to we get in to there. serve. Yes, know. sir. And we have to get in there, we have to get in there uh, safely. So we, we, we're keeping that constant. But we'll be able to have, a, yeah. hopefully, a, a, a number that we can work with and then develop a plan off of that number prior to the students come back. We'll have to do it quickly, but we'll do it. Madam Chair, I have one final question, and I'm done. Um, it's, it's with the contractors, and and I, um, you know, I know some other jurisdictions, like you know, like Calvert County and some places like that, we use uh, contractors to help uh, drive uh, uh, the students to school. And um, you know, to the degree that what I want to say is, uh, is is partially a question. Hopefully, we are talking to them about possibly su supplanting if we have a, a shortage. Uh, I'll tell you in my other capacity, um, working uh, for, for Congressman Hoyer, um, tracking transit issues, small business issues, a lot of our uh, contractors who do that work are, are struggling right now because of the decreased routes. And I would just say, uh, economic standpoint, it could be helping a small business economy um, all by also addressing a need we have in our school system if we just can't find the drivers and possibly contracting uh, that out to those folks who, who need it. So 
want to put that out there, not as necessarily a permanent thing, but just saying that there's a need right now on both sides. Uh, they don't want to lay people off. We need drivers. Uh, it sounds like there may be something that can be addressed there. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Delegate Valentino Smith. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning. Delegate Lewis, you know, is always so thorough. He asked a lot of my questions too. So I just want to do a little clarification. Um, it's always good to see you, Dr. Fawcett and um, Dr. Saunders and Mr. Stanton. You always How keep you doing. So thank you. Um, I just wanted to clarify a couple of things. One is I agree with Delegate Lewis that nightmare is probably one of the best adjectives, if not many more, for what you're about to have to try to undertake. So with the 196 drivers that you need, um, but you're hopeful that you don't have full capacity because of people choosing not to come back or parents choosing to drive, at what point do you think you'll have that collision of where you know how short you are um, before the time that school starts to be able to address the deficit or the need? Let me, before Rudy says something, let me just say this. We, we've been consistently short even before COVID. So let me yeah. just be clear. This, this as, as Dr. Saunders said, and Mark knows, you know, I've been here two and a half years trying to deal with the uh, bus transportation issue. So this has been a, a, an issue that's been constant. So when we say 196, this understand we always have 100 plus. Uh, so that's, that's another thing. The issue with COVID even makes it worse because people don't want to drive buses in some cases. And the ones that are still on payroll, we've got to make sure they're coming back. The, the other thing we, we took into account, and, and Dr. Saunders can, and Mark can talk a little bit about, but last year we put together a transportation task force. With that task force, we looked at reducing routes and centralizing routes. Because of that, understand, we reduced routes, I think, by 800 routes, which will free up additional staff. Understand, if we didn't free up those routes, we even have more of an issue if we didn't go to what we call centralized stops. So at this point, I think it's, issue, it's, it's an issue for us. It's constant recruitment, which our HR department is doing all year round, virtually whatever. So at the end of the day, this is going to be an ongoing challenge. We hope we're going to be better off than we were last year, even before COVID, because <laughs> one, we're constantly recruiting, two, we're going to have, we hope, less students at this point to get us through the remaining of the year. And three, we reduced uh, some of the bus routes to go to centralized stops. So, Rudy, if you want to comment, that's, I just wanted to close the loop on that. And that's, a, and that's an excellent point, Mr. Stanton. The, um, like, like you said, we've been dealing with vacancies for quite a while. So our, our foremen are excellent. They, they are very adept at making substitutions and, and getting the most out of what we do have. Our drivers have been very flexible. You know, they'll drop off a group of kids and have a little bit of time for the next run and say, is anybody short? And they'll go pick some kids up. So we get kids to school and home every day, even when we're short. It's not always on time. It's not always at the, you know, the, the way the plan was originally made, but we're able to adapt and do that. Um, and as far as the, the mention of consolidated stops, if you're not familiar with that, we found before that one of the issues was we had each route stopping many times because they were going on almost every corner within a community picking up kids. And we realized that if we just asked our families to walk a little further, you know, there's nothing unreasonable. There's no staff, no bus stop that's going to be more than a mile from their home or anything like that. But if we could get parents to walk a little further to the stop, then we'd only have to stop one time and we could get that route moving a little faster. So we've done some of that. This this is something we were working on pre-pandemic with the task force and we would have rolled it out this school year if we had opened in August and we're going to do some of that now and you'll see even more of that when we open in the fall so we hope that's going to help to compensate for some of the shortage and the one thing and then I'll let, let you say can you talk about the uh, technology piece we've added to the bus drivers and stuff yes so previously one of the things that's happened is we, we had a bus app before so that parents could try to follow their bus. It looked similar to Uber in that way that you could um, see where the bus was. One of the challenges with that bus app was it was a, it 
was determined that that bus had to take that route that day. Well, when you have this many shortages and people substituting and covering, sometimes a parent would look there and say, well, my bus is nowhere near my house because that bus isn't coming, but a substitute bus. So one of the improvements we've made is we put tablets on all of our buses for our drivers this year so that when I get on the bus, I would log in with who the driver is, the bus number, and the route I'm driving that day so that the bus set would be in more real time and we'd have a better job, at least for parents knowing if the bus is going to be late, if there's any change, they could at least see it and plan for it and know, you know, if it's within whatever distance to their home so they can make plans on when to send their kids out. We hope that's going to help with some of this. The other thing that is going to be added to that tablet is that the drivers will soon have turn by turn directions added to the tablet. So that's also going to assist when they have to substitute and they aren't as familiar with the route to help them because some of the time was just people figuring out where to go. You know, they, to be honest, we were a little antiquated and it was just somebody gave them a printout and they had to read that between, you know, each stop, read where the next one was, et cetera. So we hope that all these um, technology advancements are going to help us be better at doing that. Thank you. And, and Madam Chair, if I may, just in closing, you know, we realize you've been struggling even before the pandemic and this has only exasperated what your struggles are and, and, and how you're dealing with them. So while we're in our 90 days, and the good Delegate Lewis just joined in appropriations, really all we can do is make sure that we're helping wherever we can with respect to the allocation of funds. And so we are looking at how much of the CARES money so far has actually been spent. And we just got a supplemental sent down for the MSD money that's supposed to be sent down to help schools open. But I guess what we would be interested in is you keeping us informed as to whether or not you need resources that you are unable to ascertain because you don't have the funds so that we can start to figure out whether or not we need more of the federal money to be designated based on the proportion of the problem that we have rather than by proportion of our population um, in that case. And we can only help you, you know, Delegate Proctor was asking if we get more money, can we pay more money and hire people? You seem to think that that isn't always the nexus to our shortage, but whether you're having enough money for the cleaning, the supplies that you need and for the PPE. Um, and to the extent you start to come up short, I know Mr. Stanton's got a ledger there, probably keeping track. I sure um, do. <laughs> you need, you need to, to let us know and through the county council so we can work with making sure that the CARES money, um, is one being spent, spent and not held in the governor's office, there's about 1.1 billion left after the supplemental that came down yesterday and that we can make sure we're getting the proportion of what we need based on need, not just proportion of the population. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any other questions, Dr. Watts? My, Madam Chair, may I yes, ask Delegate one Turner. question? One Turner. question, I, I might have missed it, but when is all this going to start or has it started? With the buses? Which part? You mean the return to school? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When when are we going to return to school? When is the bus? All well, the action that you're going to put together. So to start this. So the first group of students returns on April eighth. April eighth. Wait a minute. Don't go too fast now. Okay. April eighth start. That's the first one. Okay. And that'll be um, kindergarten through sixth grade. Okay. And twelfth graders. And 12th graders? 12th graders and special needs students. Okay, and special needs. Okay, and special needs. Okay, I got And, I'm and then the following me. week on April uh -huh. 15th. April 15th. Okay. That will be 7th, 8th graders. 7th and 8th graders. And 9th, 10th, 11th graders. 9th, 11th. Okay, that's how you can able to do this with the buses. Have you separate them through the dates? Well, now, well, well no, so the split with the buses is going to be, you're going to have half the students eligible to come on Mondays and Tuesdays. Right. Okay, I did put that on here. I got and the Monday other and half Tuesday will start on Thursday, Thursday and Friday, Friday, based on yeah. alphabet. Yes. yes. On alphabet. Okay. But let me just say, we've had buses throughout the pandemic. Right. We've That's been right. Transporting limited numbers of students. Our special needs students that attend now public schools, uh -huh. we, we have um, transported them since the beginning of the school year. 
Oh, okay. Those are students whose needs were such that they it wasn't going to be conducive to do virtual learning. So as those schools have opened, we have had some students who, and of course it was up to parents whether they chose that option, but mm -hmm. we have had an opportunity to do some of these things throughout the pandemic, but we have had some students going to school. Okay, I got this, I'm taking notes. <laughs> Thank okay. you. And, and, and to be honest with you, that, that process of, of the non-pub routes has helped us prepare for the regular routes to see what the issues come up and, and the concerns of the bus drivers and those kind of things. Dr. Okay. Valentino Smith, did you have another question or is your hand just up? Oh, um, I have a question. With all the technology that you have that you referenced, um, if, if a parent uh, changes locations, changes schools, is it the school's responsibility to get the bus route set up or does the parent contact you in some way? How, we, how we get our information from the student information system. So if a parent moves or if a parent transfers schools, once that's updated in the school max student information system, it'll feed us and send us a message, you know, to set the bus up for that address. Hmm. What about, um, uh, general questions. I guess those are on your website. So we do have some frequently asked questions on our website. We also have a module through our website that parents can go on called the transportation resolution system. So it's like an online help ticket, if you will, that comes to someone in transportation. Sometimes it's actually transportation. Sometimes it's more of a special education question, but whatever the case may be, we can route it to the appropriate person. We also have a phone bank that is manned from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. for parents to call in for questions. Usually the first two weeks, it's it's inundated. The first two weeks when people just try to figure out, am I at the right stop? You know, my bus hasn't come yet, whatever the case may be. But we do have people that man that from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And that'll probably start about two weeks before the students first return back to school. Thank you. Delegate Watson. Thank you, Delegate Proctor. Just one question, I apologize if I missed it. Has every bus driver been given the opportunity to have a uh, COVID vaccine? All Prince George's County right. police have had that opportunity. So drivers- Yes, they have. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting for my second shot. <laughs> <laughs> and, and all, and they all have that opportunity. Our drivers, our bus attendants, our, our staff at the lots, trainers, they all have that opportunity. And we expect that their second shots, if they chose to receive it, will be before the April, what's that date you just gave me when the first group of students come back? Before the April 8th date, right? So they were in the first group that got the links. So hopefully they've all had their first shot. And a lot of my people have already told me they've had their second shot. You know, they've uh, had an opportunity. It's just a matter of when they registered. You know, obviously right. we're not controlling that far. But we did kind of get them to the front of the line. We sent them the link before anybody else to get them moving before the rest of the staff. Oh, so yes, they, they, had, they have an opportunity. All right. Appreciate that. Thanks. Now, now, just to understand, it's not mandatory. There's no, it's not a mandatory, mandatory requirement that bus drivers or teachers take the vaccine. I understand. That's why I said offer. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I got it. I, I, I got it. I understand. I got it. About what percent of the uh, staff would you say opted to take the? I don't have that information. We don't. Yeah, we don't have that information. They do that directly. We I can only know. we can only what we find out, and I think Dr. Golson has that is we can only find out who actually registered to take the to take the vaccine. We don't know for sure how many actual staff actually have taken it, and how many staff have have not decided to take it. Yeah, uh, Delegate Parker, what she did, uh, what Dr. Golson did prior, was she did a, a survey again and and asked employees, and she probably has that percentage. If the, when the vaccine becomes available, how many would take it? So she has a percentage, uh, you know, kind of a number of how many said that in the beginning they would take it. I have two questions, and there may not be answers for these two questions, but you mentioned the fact that the children have to have on a mask. 
uh, I'm going to guess that you may have a supply on the bus for those who just left it at home. Yeah, that is correct. So, so what we realized in the beginning is that their first point of contact, most children who are, uh, are the buses. So we were providing each bus driver with, um, because children are gonna leave things like they leave anything else. So uh, the schools will have an extra supply physically for walkers and, to, and the bus drivers will have an extra supply. That's, that's one thing that uh, I believe is not uh, in the shortage right now. We have, um, I wanna say we have over a million disposable masks. We're gonna issue, um, I think it was FEMA and MEMA uh, who uh, donated the cloth mask. So we have enough cloth masks to be the, the, the reusable that we're gonna issue one to, and we have children's masks, we're gonna issue one to every student and every adult, a cloth mask. But then we will have the disposable masks on hand, uh, you know, if someone were to forget it, visitors, those type of things. And, uh, and, and like I said, bus drivers will have a, a cadre uh, there on the buses to support students who forget. Yeah, we've gotten plenty of volunteers. Home Depot volunteered 100,000 masks, FEMA, 90,000, we've got so many masks, which is great, uh, that we didn't actually have to buy a lot. Um, hopefully this won't happen, but um, if you have a, especially a, a younger child who has been told, I guess, by the family not to wear a mask. And so you're at the bus stop and he doesn't wear a mask, so he can't get on the bus. How would that, ha have you had to deal with anything that or have you thought about that? That has not occurred for the kids we're transporting currently. Their parents were very clear on that requirement and they were more than willing to do that because of the other kids on the bus. Um, we know that may happen and the CEO was very clear to, you know, she's being very clear with parents that this is not optional and if you don't want to wear a mask that you have to stay on virtual instruction until things get better. Um, you know, we, we know there could be somebody, I guess you're more talking about somebody who's just being a little rebellious and saying, I'm just not going to wear it. And then we would immediately place them on um, virtual instruction. They, they would lose that ability to ride the bus and do that at that point. Oh, okay. Okay. Doc, Delegate Watson, is your hand up or did you leave it up from the last time? I left it up. My mistake. <laughs> Well, this has been wonderful. And I, I this is just the question that I thought about, and I'm, I'm not even sure it's appropriate for transportation. But I I do know that you were helping as as transportation. You, when the kids needed their meals, you were helping to deliver the meals, correct? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, so now we're going to have uh, some in school and 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 some at home, do you know if you're still going to be uh, delivering meals to these youngsters or will they somehow receive it some other way? Or do you know? So we were doing meals, uh, I want to be clear, we were only going to areas where a student did not live within walking distance of a school. So most of our students live near, even if it's not their school, they live within walking distance of a school. So I think that's going to continue and they'll be able to do that through the hybrid instructional program. We will not be continuing the buses going to the locations. And that was about 200 locations that weren't within walking distance because now all those buses will be involved in transporting students. So yeah, they'll be, they'll, they'll be picking up meals at their, at their uh, centralized school sites at that point because all the schools will be open. Okay, do we have any other questions from anyone? been wonderful it's um you know i guess everything is left to technology now and you seem to really be taking advantage of it and that that is wonderful um we get we get these questions and now we know how who to refer them to <laughs> but you guys are doing a wonderful job it's a it's a maze, M-A-Z-E, and I don't know how you figure it out, but you absolutely do a wonderful job, and we thank you for everything you do, protecting those kids back and forth to school. And if there are comments or questions, did anyone else have a comment?
comment or question. Well, no, I, I trust I trust Mr. Stanton will let us know about the money as soon as possible. Yeah, to be and just on the money, we have been applying for all the grants and we've been getting uh, plenty of the uh, funding so far. If something changes, we'll, we'll let you know. The CFO uh, has been keeping track of all the funding. We just submitted the uh, another URSA grant. Uh, so we're going to be getting a, a bunch of supplies and stuff. So if something changes, we'll give you a call. But I feel very comfortable we're getting our funding, even though we're a large school district, we're getting what we need. That's good to hear. It's good to know there's extra money out there, however. That's right. <laughs> yeah. 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 I don't know how extra it is, but you got people willing to fight for it. So right. we appreciate that. Just for, yeah. just, for, just for clarification, I know you have 190 some vacancies for drivers. You have all the buses you need at this point? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, we have plenty of buses. We have plenty of buses. So, uh, I, I wish that were our problem. <laughs> so, <laughs> that'd be a great route to have. Yeah, we, we have enough buses for every route, and then we have extra buses that we keep for, you know, while buses are in repair or service or whatever the case may be. So right now we're fine with the numbers of buses, but thank you. And Comar requires us to, uh, you know, to cycle the buses out. Uh, we cycle the buses out after 12 years of, of duty. And so we have a rotation where we purchase approximately 100 new buses every year. So that, that rotation continues. Like Dr. Sandra said, if we had if we had enough drivers for every bus, we would have more than enough. We, we have the buses. We just need the people to drive them safely. Hmm. And it's not getting them trained. It's just that they, they're just not available. Right. You know, we, we actually have paid training. I, I don't know if Dr. Saunders mentioned that. I know he mentioned that we have an aggressive training program, but you know, you'll see a lot of CDL signs. You'll see the signs that say uh, CDL training on the, on the streets and things like that. We actually pay. That's when he said we, we take people who do not have a CDL, but who are willing to work with to get one. So we actually pay them doing training for six weeks. And then Dr. Saunders, then after, after we train, and they, they of course they have their learners by that time, then, it, then there's a, a, a window of time that they have to actually get their CDL uh, yes. because after the training they don't get paid until they get a CDL and, and if they don't get the CDL in that, in that period of time then of course pay, pay, payment ends but whenever they get it we'll take them back <laughs> but the drive, drive, driver's test is just like anybody else some people pass it some people don't but most people pass it if they go through our training program one of the things that's challenging with, with people who have a CDL that a lot of people don't know is after you get your CDL, you still have a lot of things to maintain it. So they still have to pass an annual physical and then they have to be able to pass random drug testing, drug and alcohol mm -hmm. tests. And that sometimes it's a challenge. So, and then they also, we have to monitor driver's licenses. Um, they can't have but two points on their driver's license. That's their personal driver's license. So every Monday I get a report from MBA and Unlike other employees, if they have a problem over the weekend, it still impacts their ability to come to work on Monday. So those are some of the challenges with maintaining employment in that class. Yeah, we had just an example. We had a driver who, who was diagnosed with sleep apnea, and I believe his machine didn't come in on time or something. And because his machine hadn't come in, he actually they actually suspended his license until he was able to get the sleep apnea machine. That's just because... You know, they want to make sure drivers get the proper rest so that they can drive, you know, in the morning, you know, with the mandated time. So it's simple things like that that will even uh -huh. cause drivers to be delayed or medical situations where they, they, they're not able to get that CD, CDL. Uh, that, that's, that's my story about why I can't get a CDL. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Dr. Fawcett. You're welcome. <laughs> I was wondering why I couldn't get you to drive. Yeah, I can't. <laughs> if, this, if this is not appropriate, if this is not an appropriate question, just skip over it. But I'm wondering, what is the, the starting salary for a bus driver? I mean, oh, it's appropriate. We okay. want to get it out okay. there, Rudy. Okay. It's, it's around $19. $19 an hour. It's a little over $19 an hour. $19 an hour. Wow. Yes. Yeah, I've recommended a few friends to apply for bus driver since they've been unemployed. <laughs> so trust me. So it, it, I mean, it's a lot of things that are challenging with that. Right. You know, bus drivers are, are split shifts, you know, so they do time in the morning, then they have a gap, and then they do time in the afternoon. So, you know, a driver may start their day at six o'clock in the morning, uh, run routes till nine, ten o'clock, come back around one or two, split the shift. So it's a lot of things that go into it. It's not a normal 
schedule, normal day. So there's mm -hmm. different things that factor into the uh, attraction, you know, of actually, you know, being a school bus driver. Um, and then they can choose to be aggressive. If they want to earn more money, they can use that time in the middle and do field trips if they want or extra activities for the schools. They can do athletic games, like people that drive, you know, to the evening basketball games and, you know, weekend events and things like that. So there's opportunities for them to supplement their income um, with that extra work if they choose to. But like I said, it's a long day and it's not easy work, so. What, per what percentage of your drivers are women? I'm sorry? What percentage of your drivers are women? I don't have that data. I do, know, I do know there are a lot. I do know that <laughs> yeah. between drivers and attendants, but I don't have an exact percentage. But but I do know we have many. Okay. And we'll, we'll go back to the attendants. What, what are they making an hour? Well, they're in, of course, they're on a support scale. So their, their salary, I believe, it, I believe I have to look at the updated scale. I think it starts around 14, 13 to $14 an hour, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and, but the difference is we don't have as many attendants. We only have them on special needs buses. So we probably have about 300 or so attendants. I'm asking all this because we have a meeting this evening with the Southern Maryland Minority Chamber. Uh, and I think a lot of you know uh, Miranda Jackson. Yes. Yeah, she's gonna be one of our speakers. So I really wanted to share this information uh, at the meeting. This we evening. can get you the specifics to that if you're interested. Okay. Well, I think I'm. I think you're close enough. Um, okay. You know, uh, and 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 in addition to drivers, are you also looking for the assistance, the attendance, or? Well, what we're really looking for, in addition to the full-time attendance, we have substitute attendants who cover when they aren't available. We are looking for them at all times. We keep that posting on the website constantly. And that's really what I graded that. It makes a little less and it doesn't have benefits, but it gives people some flexibility. And that's what we really need, our substitute bus attendants at all times. Yeah, so, so I believe with, with, our, with our FTEs that are allocated for attendance, we don't really have a shortage of attendance. We fill those positions, those full-time positions as soon as they become available. And we actually encourage those uh, employees if they're eligible to actually you know go on and try to be drivers but some of them they just they don't want to have the uh you know the added stress of actually driving i mean you know think about it every day you you know you have multiple groups of children you know um you know basically relying on you to do your job do it well and some people just don't want that that stress you know of driving a, a bus with uh, 50 kids on it well, again, uh, I don't see any other hands. So I just want to say thank you for being with us this morning and thank you for all you do. Um, and we have uh, Tylenol in the cabinets for anybody who needs it. <laughs> I've got it in my desk. <laughs> all right. Enjoy the rest of your day. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Right. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. All right, everybody. All right, Ron. Right. Right. Yeah, y'all.